Hey everyone, hi. Uh, my name is Bernie O'Rourke and I am the Extension Youth Livestock Specialist here at UW-Madison Animal Sciences. And um, I am so pleased to uh, be able to help coordinate this event for you guys today. Uh, we're gonna check out the sheep unit and uh, what a better way to do a Friday afternoon by checking out uh, what the animals are up to on a Friday afternoon. Um, since we're all kind of operating in this new, different kind of space, um, it's gonna be fun to check out the sheep unit and um, how that's gonna work out for the afternoon. So we're gonna spend the next hour and maybe a little bit uh, checking out what Todd Taylor has planned for us today. Uh, he's got lots of lambs and lots of activities going on, so we're gonna get right into them. But before I, um, we get going on that, I wanna just show you uh, just a couple of things to think about as we're getting ready for um, the event today. Um, one, um, welcome, of course. Uh, secondly, just to kind of, many of you probably know how to manage Zoom meetings, um, but we just want to make sure that you guys are knowing how to manage Zooms related to the mute and unmuting. Um, so make sure your mic is muted pretty much through the whole thing today. Um, if you've got questions, we want you to use the chat box. So um, you can see here, when you click on the chat box down here below, you can type in any questions that you might have and I'll be checking those out throughout the day. So um, please ask any questions there. And then um, you can certainly leave your video on if you want. It's, it's great to see your guys' faces and what your, your life is at home there. But if um, the video starts getting a little wonky or if the audio starts to kind of uh, be a little rough, we might ask you to kind of shut down your video. Um, you'll still see Todd and us, but we just won't be able to see you. So we'll see how this goes and, and go from there. Um, firstly, this is the first one of these virtual tours that we're gonna do. Um, so Todd and the sheep unit are kind of the guinea pigs for this new type of activity. So we're grateful for Todd in which to, to do that. And then next week, um, if you're interested in swine unit, um, our Katie Walsh, uh, who is helping assist today in letting people into the room, uh, she'll be on board next week in the sheep unit or in the swine unit. So there's some neat things there if you're interested in swine. We have a surgery suite there that they can see. Um, You'll get to see some baby pigs, um, and there's quite a bit of other things that we have in store for you next week. And then following will be the beef units in Arlington and Lancaster. Uh, so there should be some plenty of baby calves running around. And then uh, the farm center, we'll talk a little bit more, will be the last one we'll host uh, during this time. So I'm just gonna show a map. Uh, Todd sent me a, a nice map for us to look at or for you to kind of see what the sheep unit looks like from an aerial version, like from above. And um, he'll talk and go through some of these buildings, but I think it was a neat picture for him to show how big the pastures are and the land that surrounds the two buildings in the middle. And uh, he'll go into that, and that might be the, the first part he'll, he'll go into. But what I wanna do before we get, um, I, I let, um, Todd take the reins is I want to throw this poll out for you. I've got a few questions for you guys to ask or to answer. There's about 170 of you guys on. I'd love for you to add, answer these. I think there's four questions. Um, what's been the best thing about being in quarantine? So that's, that'll be fun to see what kind of interesting ideas and, and answers we get. What's your favorite animal? Uh, so far, sheep's winning. Big surprise, huh, Todd? <laughs> um, are, you, today. are you in the sheep or 4-H program? Are you in FFA? And then what state are you from? And um, if you don't, if you're from another state that we don't have referenced here, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Michigan, or Illinois, please throw that in the chat box. We'd love to know if you're from another state um, participating in our in our session today. So um, I think I'll let this stay up. Um, uh, Todd is gonna talk here in a little bit. Um, we've got somebody from South Africa. Well, that's, that's stupendous. Welcome. Uh, thank, we're, we're grateful to have you. Um, South Dakota, Ohio, 
That's great. So if you're from another state that we don't have listed there, five states, uh, go ahead and throw that in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. All right. So I think at this point, um, we're going to we're gonna let the poll go for a little while. I think I can still do that at the same time as I let Todd uh, go ahead and start presenting what he has um, offered for us today. Uh, Todd, take it away. Well, it looks like there's still a lot of people coming on, but this is exciting to see the, the response and the, and the uh, uh, people that have joined us today. I've seen, I've recognized some names as they come across my screen as I'm a co-host. I'm seeing who's, who's logging in, and I think it's pretty cool. So uh, this is going to be fun. We're, uh, uh, you know, kind of at a, at a lull right now, but boy, we picked a nice day, beautiful weather. It's going to be kind of fun to walk around and, and visit with you a little bit. Again, as Bernie said, uh, my name is Todd Taylor. Uh, I'm not originally from Wisconsin. I actually grew up in Larry. Uh, he was a longtime shepherd at the University of Wyoming from about 75 through the early 2000s and retired. So I grew up raising sheep in a, in a state-run sheep barn like this. In the sheep unit down there as well. So I uh, had a lot of experience with sheep and with livestock in general. Uh, so I, I really uh, uh, thank you guys for coming on and, and look forward to visiting with you. And, and as Bernie said, as you have questions, please uh, feel free to, to reach out to her and, and ask her those questions. And, and uh, we'll try to make this a, a fun and educational day. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of going to approach this. I got to see if I can get my camera to flip around here now. Let's see. Where is it? There we go. All right. Instead of looking at my face, you guys came to see some sheep. So uh, I'm going to try to do this. I don't have a fancy dance uh, holder for my phone, so this is on my phone. I'm going to try to try to be still and steady and, and show you what's going on here. As I said, we're kind of at a lull. Uh, one thing I always do, and I'm going to try to make this somewhat uh, hit different levels of, of people, of everybody from uh, anybody that doesn't know anything about sheep and never been around sheep, to try to touch on a few things that might help some producers or some some young producers that I know we have online as well. So, uh, you know, we, we do these tours a lot this time of year for fourth grade students in particular, all the way up to high school students. We have kids that come out here and want to learn something about sheep or teachers that want to want to educate their, their, their uh, students about sheep and agriculture in, in general. So uh, this happens to, to just kind of fall in that time of year and, and it's going to work out nicely. The first thing I always ask those students is, and, and you guys can type this into the chat box if you want, and, and Bernie can, can kind of keep track of this. You know, one thing that's unique about sheep is they're one of the few farm species that I know of that these ewes right here in front of us, or these female sheep right here in front of us, we can harvest or we can produce hey. products every year, year in and year out, without actually sacrificing the ewe themselves. If you think about that, see if you can think about the three consumable products that we can get from these ewes. Uh, growing up in Wyoming, I thought about two of them quite often, and the third one didn't really dawn on me until I moved to Wisconsin. So uh, uh, you'll have to come back. I'm going to be on it. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. There's a lot of activity going on out here today. So maintenance, maintenance guy just popped his head in the door. So anyway, you know, there's three products that we can consume from, from sheep year in and year out. And I just saw one of them pop up across the screen and all three of them were there. So the first one that most people think about is meat. These ewes have lambs and we can, we can consume meat from their lambs year in and year out. They produce lambs for you know, anywhere from five to 10 years out of their lifespan, some of them even longer than that. Um, wool, wool is another one that we can get off of them. We shear these ewes once a year and actually you're gonna get to see some of that today. We've got some shearing going on in the South Barn and we're gonna, we're gonna try to uh, show you what that's all about, how it's done, and what we can use the wool for. And when I moved to Wisconsin, I found out that there's a milk industry in the sheep business too, and I did not realize that until I moved to Wisconsin. It's not something growing up out west that we see a lot of is, is milk production in, in Wyoming and the western states. So, so that was new to me. They use sheep milk a lot for cheeses, for blends, uh, with cow and, and goat milk. And uh, uh, commonly use sheep milk in blends for those cheeses. The other thing I also want to point out is sheep, in terms of livestock species, were probably one of the earliest ones ever domesticated for human use. Uh, if you look back into history books and, 
uh, you know, some of your uh, biblical books and things like that, sheep were, were domesticated early, early on for human use. And for that reason, they've been domesticated and selected for year, years and years and years to the point where now it would be really hard for these sheep to revert back to the wild, wild that they came from. There are some species of sheep that are still wild, but the sheep that we raise now domestically would not survive very well. And the biggest reason is, is the wool production that they have. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get across the road. Uh, if we don't take this wool off of them, it's actually detrimental to their health, health over time, okay? So those are some things to keep in mind as we go along. I also want to throw you some statistics. We are in Wisconsin. Um, and as I said, I grew up out west. Where are most of the sheep developed or where are most of the sheep raised in the United States? Where do you think Wisconsin plays into the, Wisconsin, into the sheep industry in the United States? Well, I can tell you right now, not very high in terms of numbers of sheep. There are just about 6 million sheep in the United States. Of those, about 80,000 of them are presently or reside in the state of Wisconsin. We have about 80,000 sheep in the state of Wisconsin. That ranks us about 19th in the United States in terms of which of states that produce the most sheep. Where do you find most of the sheep in the United States? Type that in the chat box if you want. I'll give you a couple of minutes. And these, this is areas that are arid, that are dry, that don't have a lot of feed resources. Um, they, they don't... Uh, uh, have water as, as relatively close together as what some of our areas in the Midwest would have and in, as we get into the East. So we're thinking primarily of the Western and Southwest United States, the Rocky Mountain area down into Texas. In fact, the top five states in the United States currently, have, according to the, to the 2017 census, the top five sheep producing states, of course, were Texas, California, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah. Those are the top five. Wisconsin doesn't rank anywhere in the top 10 in terms of the number of sheep produced in the state when we talk about national sheep inventory. However, when you look at people or farms that are raising sheep, that's a little different. That's a little different. A lot of small flocks populate the Midwestern states. The top five states in the United States for sheep flocks, it still, still is Texas and Arizona are, are the top two in terms of number of flocks out there. There's almost 15,000 flocks in the state of Texas. There's about 7,500 in Arizona. But then you move into the top 10 states, there's a lot of Midwestern and Eastern states. Ohio is number three, drop down to uh, number six is Pennsylvania, Missouri is number eight. And looky there, Wisconsin shows up as number nine in terms of flocks in the United States. There are over 2,800 flocks in, or uh, farms in the state of Wisconsin that have a few sheep. However, we only have 80,000 sheep in the state. So if you do the math, that works out to an average flock size of about 28 head. Whereas some of the other states out west have got as many as four or 5,000 sheep in those flocks, okay? Our flock here at the station is currently right around 600 head counting the lambs that we have on the ground. There are only 26 flocks in the state of Wisconsin that have more than 300 head. And we are one of those. And I would imagine if you extrapolated that up to 500 head, it would drop down below 10. And we are one of the top 10 flocks in the state of Wisconsin. So it's an area that's very small, okay? When we talk about these big flocks out west that are running thousands and thousands of sheep, they're running them on thousands and thousands of acres as well. And we don't have those kind of resources in the state of Wisconsin. So that's where we're at. Uh, Bernie, if you see any questions coming up, real yeah, we do have some. We do have some questions, Todd. So um, a few of the kids, first of all, just a way of comment on your related to the states that have the most sheep. They did pretty well. They have Texas and Wyoming, North Carol or North Dakota, um, Oklahoma was another guess. Um, but then we also had. Um, some out east. Some people said Rhode Island. So um, I think with some of your data, that was kind of interesting where some of those kids got that right. So some uh, more flocks are kind of getting bigger in the east um, as well over time. And then um, one, there was a there was a question related to um, what breeds of sheep. I think are you want to tackle that one now, or will you do that one later? Yeah, I can do that. So so that's an in interesting question, and and uh, it's it's a very good question. As I said, sheep are raised for three different projects or, or products, and and all these ewes went back outside. I fed them, and we'll go outside here in a minute. And we'll look at them from the outside, um, but. Each breed is, is kind of designed a little differently. There's, there's you know, thousands of breeds in the, in the world, and there's, I think there's close to 200 alone in the United States that show up at different various levels. 
each breed kind of has their own claim to fame. And here at the University of Wisconsin, we've gotten to where we raise three breeds currently that represent three different segments of the industry. I talked about meat production, and I don't know if you can see them. I don't know. I can't, I can't really scroll in, but we'll go outside and talk about them. These shoes in this pen right here, these black face shoes that are eaten on the hay bale outside, those are Hampshire ewes. Those are what we would classify as a meat breed, a breed that's known for producing uh, animals that grow fast on, on less feed, have a little higher feed efficiency, and, and are utilized a lot to produce protein for human consumption in the way of lambs that, that are harvested for meat, leg of lamb, lamb chops, ground lamb, all those different kinds of things. We're gonna skip this group here in the middle for a minute. Um, and go to the, the third pen over here. And I actually have our three breeds kind of sorted in, if I, or our three breeds sorted in the pens accordingly. This group out here, and again, we'll have to go outside and look at them. This is a relatively young breed in the United States. It was actually developed out west in Dubois, Idaho. They are a wool breed sheep. Uh, predominantly the wool breed sheep in the United States that are raised for wool production for, for fleeces that, that are utilized for clothing. And we'll talk a little bit about more about what we use, we use wool for. Our, our Rambouillet descent, but these are a Targi. These were developed from Rambouillets, but they were developed out west to be just a tick more rugged, a little bit stronger, a little bit more prolific, a little larger framed, and still have a high quality wool clip. Uh, you find mo majority of the Targi breed in the United States is in the Northwest, in the, in the Northern Rocky Mountains, from uh, Wyoming and Northern Utah up into Montana. In fact, about 60, 65% of our registration association is in the state of Montana alone. They just seem to do a little bit better in the mountains and up in the Forest Service lands than what the traditional Rambouillets that you find in most of West Texas and Arizona and the desert areas in the south southwestern part of the United States. So the Targis were developed to take advantage of those, those climates. The third breed we have here that's in the middle pen, and like I said, I'll, I'll go outside and we'll, we'll touch base on them a little bit more as we go around the corner. Those are a polypay, and that's another young breed that was developed in Dubois, Idaho but have really found a niche in the Midwest. And in, in, in our area, uh, through the, the central part of the Midwest, uh, uh, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, the eastern side of South Dakota and down into Nebraska, Kansas, uh, even as far east as Pennsylvania and into the Carolinas. And that's the polypay breed. Uh, the polypays were meant to be a, a kind of an intermittent wool breed. They still have some wool quality, but more so are a very prolific breed that can take take advantage or that we can utilize in these areas that have uh, lands that we can stock a little heavier. And we've got a little bit more labor and, and can maintain them a little bit better and take advantage of their prolificacy. And what I mean by prolificacy is it's very common for them to have multiple births and not so common in a lot of the traditional white face breeds. Uh, it's not uncommon for them to have triplets and, and at least twins, ideally twins, but it's very common for having triplets and on occasion they have quads or four lambs at a time. So they, can, they, they require a little bit more resources and, and to take advantage of those extra lambs. They have to be fed a little bit more and you have to kind of put a little bit more labor into them to make sure that all those lambs survive and are taken care of. So they've really found a market in the Midwest and areas that have that, those resources. So, so those are the three of the breeds that we have here. Other breeds that you'll find throughout the United States, again, I, like I said, the, the Rambouillets were the traditional white face. Uh, Suffolk's are more known as the the predominant meat breed or terminal sire breed that are utilized in the Western commercial flocks, but then you also have Dorsets, you have uh, Columbia's or another mid middle of the road wool breed type sheep that are very big and, and produce a lot of wool that's just a little bit coarser. Uh, I could go on and on and on and name a lot of different breeds and, and you know, and, and a lot of you, uh, if you're in a 4-H and FFA project, probably have your own breed that you're showing and taking care of. So, uh, so hopefully that kind of gets us started on the breeds. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about today is the life cycle or, and how we get these lamb and these sheep going. And, and that's why we started in this barn. In the winter time, we lamb in the winter. When do most of the sheep in the United States, when are most of them born? Does anybody know? And if you want to comment on that, um, I'll give you a hint. It's actually just starting right now. The majority of the commercial operations in the United States are just now starting to lamb. Uh, we lamb a little earlier in the year because we have facilities we can do it. We can lamb inside. Most sheep in the United States are probably born on pasture or out on the range, uh, although there are getting to be more and more and more shed operations out west. But if you think about it, when I was a kid, the average flock size in the state of Wyoming, there was a lot of them over 20,000 ewes. They're not gonna be able to run those 20,000 ewes through a barn very effectively, so they range lambs. 
and they lamb when the weather's a little bit nicer in April and May and into June, if that makes sense. In our situation, we've got a barn where we can lamb a little earlier in the year. We can push these lambs along a little bit harder and be able to market them a little earlier in the year when the prices are a little bit higher because the demand is there, but the supply is not, if that makes sense. So we lamb a little earlier. Plus, we use these sheep a lot for re research and teaching, and we need them around when students are on campus so that they can do things. And so we need lambs earlier in the year um, for, for students to use when they're young. And then we need finished lambs in the fall, usually, so we can have them for teaching, for classwork, and for research work in the fall as well. So we lamb in January, but we lamb in this barn. We bring the ewes in in December put them in this barn, bring them in at night, shut the doors down. You can see it's got lots of bright, clean, fresh straw. We actually just cleaned this barn out last week and started over fresh again. As we need to, we add more straw to keep it dry and clean in here. Shut the ewes in, they're shut in at night. It actually raises the temperature in this barn by about 10 to 15 degrees when all those ewes come in here and the doors are shut up at night. So it's a nice area for the lambs to be born. Even in the cold of January, they do very, very well in this barn. Now we don't leave them out here when they're born and we'll walk into what we call our lambing room or a maternity ward uh, where we put the, the mamas and babies after the lambs are born and we'll talk a little bit about that. Any questions so far, Bernie, that they can yeah. to touch base with quick? Yeah, there's a good question when you're related to the barn size. There's a question related to, do you, really, do you need to have a barn that big? And I think that might be just a little bit on facilities that are unique to the sheep unit where there's a lot of numbers of, of sheep that we kind of work through compared to somebody who's maybe starting out or, or just has a, a smaller flock. You want to comment on that? Sure. You don't need a barn this big. I mean, we use a barn this big and we stock it. We keep it full. Like I said, this barn will hold 200 ewes in the wintertime fairly comfortably. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to put too many more than that in here. But the neat thing about sheep and one thing that we're finding in one reason Wisconsin is so big in terms of sheep numbers and, and flocks. And as I said, there's only 28 head. There's a lot of old barns out there that can be converted and used for sheep. Sheep are a species that are much easier to get into, much lower cost in terms of capital investment. Pretty easy to convert an old dairy barn or even an old hog barn into a sheep facility. Um, we've actually done that for my kids. They're in 4-H and FFA, have grown up in 4-H and FFA, have their flocks of their own, and we've got them scattered out in about four or five other barns throughout the county or throughout the area, uh, not here at the station. And most of them are old dairy and hog barns that we've converted and, and, and made work for sheep. So they don't need to be this big. Uh, the big thing to keep in mind, and honestly, sheep don't need a lot of shelter uh, in the wintertime if you leave the fleeces on them. But if you don't have facilities like this, you don't want to be shearing in the winter or early spring, you know, and you don't want to be lambing in the winter or early spring. You'd want to wait and lamb in, in May and maybe not even shear those ewes until April. We'll talk a little bit more about shearing, but we do shear our ewes prior to lambing. So if you do the math on that, we like to shear about 30 to 45 days before the first ewe starts to lamb, which in our case is usually the middle of January. That means we shear in December. Uh, and people think that that is a little bit strange. And, and, uh, but in order, to do, you know, in order to do that, we have to have this barn so we can bring them in and keep them out of the cold, keep them dry, and keep them out of the wind. And, and baby lambs born that time of year do very well as well if you keep the drafts and keep them dry and keep them bedded. But you do have to have some sort of a barn that you can essentially seal up as, as tight as you can, at least on two sides. Now, you want to be careful because there is some ventilation issues, too, if you seal it up too tight. So I got to backtrack a little bit there and not give you too much misinformation. But you do still want to protect them from the elements if you're going to shear and lamb in the winter. If you're going to shear and lamb in the spring, a pasture with some tree lines, mostly for shade, and maybe to keep them a little bit drier is, is usually enough for sheep. Um, but, but as I said, you know, sheep are pretty easy to, to, to take care of and maintain without a lot of extra cost in facilities and building a fancy barn. Uh, we have just got to the point where we've got enough sheep that we need to manage a little different, spend a little bit more in investment in facilities to make it easier and more efficient for us to raise what we have. Good enough answer? Yeah, I think that's great. You might want to maybe walk to like your next station. There's a few that want to see some more sheep. So maybe while you're walking to there, I can uh, either you want to take it away and then there are some more questions, but we could do that at a, at a better break. We're going to talk real quick about the lambing room. So we've got this little guy here and he hasn't been named yet. I don't know if my, this is my wife. You're going to meet my family because we are in quarantine, but we're quarantined together. So I'm utilizing my family a little bit. So this is one of our last lambs born. We had a born 
about two weeks ago. And this little guy, like I said, triplets are, are very common in polypase, but it's also pretty hard uh, for a ewe to raise all three of them sometimes. It takes a very special ewe. She has to have enough milk, and she also has to be smart enough to let the lambs nurse uh, in turns because they can only feed two at a time. Unfortunately, unlike a cow, they only have two teeth. They only have two spigots for the lambs to get milk out of. So a good ewe, those lambs come running over and want to nurse on her. She stops and lets them nurse. But a lot of times she only gives them enough time for two of them to get their bellies full and the third one kind of gets left behind and doesn't do very well. So a lot of times we will pull the third one off and supplemental feed it. So this is our last one. Like I said, a last ewe that we had lamb a week and a half or a week or so ago. She had a set of triplets and it's the hold off them. So he's still getting bottle fed, but he's also getting bucket fed. But I did want to talk a little bit about lambing and, and what we do. Like I said, we lamb out in that big area out in the barn. But then this room here is what we call our lambing room. And if you look down this side, these, this is the critical part of a lambing room and a shed lambing situation. If you're going to lamb in the barn with as many ewes as, you've got, as we've got here, you really need to set up a jug situation or jug setup like this. A lambing jug, uh, I don't know where the term jug comes from. It's an old shepherd's term. It's been around as, as long as I can remember. That's just what they've been called. It's just simply an individual pin that we put a ewe and her lambs, okay? So we would bring that ewe in, and we'd bring the lambs in first, and this is Justin, my oldest son. Uh, Justin is home from college and, and furloughed like everybody else or, or uh, uh, destined to have to learn online. He's at South Dakota State, but he's home for the, for the duration of the, the uh, quarantine and or the, whatever you want to call it, the safer at home, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, so he's my assistant. He and, and Hayden, Hayden's over here. He's in in high school here and, and uh, they're going to help me. But we're making these, there's a couple of critical things we have to get going. And the first thing is we want to make sure they're in here where they're going to get warm. We keep this room about 50 degrees in the winter time, mostly for my comfort, not so much for the sheep, but for my comfort. But a couple of things that we want to do, the first thing is we want to make sure that they're, they're protected from, from anything that they could get. Justin, show the belly of that lamb. But when a lamb's born, they're born with this little umbilical cord right here, umbilicus right there, and usually it can be really, really long after the ewe gives birth. Okay, we want to protect those lambs from that super highway for bacteria. So we will bring them in and we will clip that down pretty short within about an inch of the body wall, and then we will dip it or disinfect it with some iodine. So, and I always say dip. I see a lot of producers that buy the spray bottles and spray them. I don't like to spray them. I want to dip them. I want to see them saturate that whole area and all the way around that. Okay, so we will do that. The other thing is, is if I had a ewe, I'd show you, we're going to strip her teats out and make sure that her udder is flowing with plenty of milk. What is that first milk called? Anybody want to want to gander a, a guess on that and why it's so critical that we want to make sure that that ewe's got plenty of it? Go ahead and throw it in the yeah. chat, guys. They're getting the answer right, colostrum, but what's it's so great, great about colostrum? Right here. Yep. This is some that I saved from a ewe that had plenty and only had a couple of lambs, and I always store some in the freezer. It's called colostrum, and it's the first milk that any mammal produces, including your mother's. Um, and it's really important that, that young uh, uh, animals get this very, very quickly in, into their system because it's the only source of antibodies. It's the only source of protection from bacterial infections, from any kind of sickness that a young animal is going to get early in their life. So we want to make sure that these lambs get that. So that's what we're using these jugs for. We're using these jugs to make sure that those lambs are healthy, the ewes are producing milk, and they're getting up and getting their bellies full. The other thing is, is I always ask kids is how does a ewe tell her lamb or lambs from somebody else, from another ewe? A lot of people want to say it's sight or looks, but it's really not. The biggest source of, of the difference is smell, is the scent of the lamb and the scent of the ewe. They get used to each other. I believe, just because I've seen it happen in the barn, is there is some sound recognition as well, because you'll hear a ewe ball for a lamb or a lamb ball for a ewe, and they'll recognize each other an awful lot of times. But still, it's ultimately that scent. If a lamb runs up to the wrong ewe and tries to nurse and the ewe smells it, first thing she does is nudge it away. So that smell is the biggest thing. So when we're lambing in a barn like this, it's real easy for cross-fostering to happen if we don't put these ewes and these lambs in these jugs on fresh dry straw and give them a few days to do the bonding and, and get, get going good, okay? So that's what the jugs are for. After a couple of days, we're gonna do a couple of things with this lamb. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take, a, actually not after a couple of days, after a few hours, after the lamb gets dry, we're gonna take a birth weight. 
And that's what this handy little bucket is over here for. <laughs> we collect a lot of performance data on our sheep. If we're trying to generate sheep that help the industry grow faster, grow more wool, uh, just perform better. Uh, so this guy, you know, so we, it looks like we forgot to turn the scale on. <laughs> so, so we always take a birth weight within a few hours of birth to make sure that we know how much they weigh so that we can check their performance from birth to weaning and from weaning on to, to so he gets to, gets a ride in the bucket for a little bit of time. He weighs 12 and a half pounds. He's actually gained four pounds because he only weighed eight when he was born. So he's doing pretty well just on milk replacer, okay? The other things that we do that are real critical is we have to keep good complete records but we put an ear tag in him. If you see, this is his name. He's number 557. He was the uh, 257th polypay lamb born in 2020, okay? We've also gone to use an electronic identification system where we can track these lambs a little bit better, okay? So this little machine right here reads this gray ear tag and tells me exactly, you know, I can look up a lot of different information on him. I can put in birth weight, birth date, uh, this lamb's already in, so you know, so he's got a lot of information on him. I can check treatment history on him. If we do treat him, we can record that. Uh, if we weigh him later on, we can record that. All that kind of stuff goes into our database so that we can collect or we can check these lambs. Okay. The last thing we do is we have to put a rubber band on their tails. Okay, we have to somehow dock their tails. Part of the domestication of sheep, and as I said, one of the reasons that that we raise sheep is for wool. So we've selected sheep for a tremendous amount of wool growth over time. And that wool grows all the way to the tip of their tail, okay? This lamb's already got a rubber band on his tail. We want that lower tail to fall off. And that's for sanitation reasons. And we turn these guys out on grass in the summertime and their feces get real soft and liquid and, and wet. Uh, they can saturate all that wool on, the, on their lower tail and it becomes a pretty, pretty nasty, pretty dirty area and typically flies like to lay there and lay their eggs and we get into fly strike issues and fly strike can be very very detrimental to a sheep operation so we do need to dock tails on the majority of the wool breed sheep in the u.s now the meat the hair breed sheep the, a lot of people raise katahdins and dorpers nowadays those sheep don't have to be docked they don't have to be uh that their tails removed but the majority of our sheep uh we have to dock all of our lambs so that is something that we have to do we do it very early when the lamb is extremely young uh, some producers might use a little bit of a, a, a painkiller because it, it does make them a little sore for a few minutes, uh, but typically they get over it relatively quickly and it's a whole lot less stress on them to dock their tails than it is to deal with doctoring them for fly strike later on in the year when, when uh, that gets an issue. So, so that's the, the, what we do in here. Uh, this room, like I said, if you come back in January, February, and March, or even this fall when I lamb in October, this room gets busy and gets really crazy. There will be mamas and babies in all of the jugs and there will usually be a lot of them in these mixing pens. And then we'll walk on out this outside door out here and there'll be a lot of them out there. I do still have one more pen of orphan lambs. Uh, we don't bottle feed everything, we do bucket feed them. And I actually have a machine that I use to, uh, we, we raised about 60 orphan lambs this year because of the prolificacy of our flock. I do have what's called a Lactec machine, which is a, milk on demand, kind of a uh, milkshake bar, so to speak. It mixes milk for the lambs as they need it. And it's a little easier to, to grow lambs out on it, but it takes a few more lambs than what I've got in this pen. To, so these guys are back to the buckets and I'm mixing milk and filling the buckets two or three times a day. So, so that's the, the lambing room. Any specific questions about here, Bernie? Yeah, some were asking about the brand of like milk replacer you use and how long when you do feed the milk replacer that those lambs are on it. So do you want to address that okay, one? Good. Yep, that's a good question. We use, uh, and, and I'm not advocating for any, uh, any one, but we just have found that the shepherd's choice is what we like to use and it's, it's easy for us to get up at our feed mill up here. Um, you know, they're all very, very good milk replacers. There's differences in all of them. The big thing is, is make sure that it is labeled for sheep. Uh, try not to use a calf milk replacer or a goat milk replacer. And I even try to shy away from these all, all in one milk replacers. They're just not balanced for lambs and lambs don't do as well on them. And if you get into some of the other species, you do have to worry about some other things um, that, that might make them, you know, copper toxicity, although milk replacer doesn't usually have added copper in it. But it's just best to find one that is labeled for sheep. Um, like I said, we like the Shepherd's Choice, but Land O'Lakes makes a good one. Uh, Merck 
uh, I can't remember. There's a lot of them out there, but just make sure. Um, our program for, for uh, uh, raising orphan lambs is, as I said, we'll bottle feed them for the first two or three days. We'll transition them to this, you know, and, and when we're bottle feeding them, we're trying to feed them about every four hour or four, four hours, um, you know, six to 10 ounces, depending on the size of the lamb. Um, but we're trying to get them transitioned to the buckets or the milking machines as quickly as we can because it's just less labor intensive to, and they actually do better um, because the milk's in front of them all the time. So we like the buckets. Once they're on the buckets, they're fed cold milk. And the reason we do that is they don't gorge themselves on it. Uh, they'll nurse for a little while, they'll take a break, and then they'll come back later on and, and nurse a little bit more later on if they're, if they're drinking cold milk. Um, the milking machine that we use is, is basically just room temperature. Uh, the only reason that it's a little bit warmer is because it's got to milk mix a small amount at a time and it mixes better if the water's a little bit warmer. But if you're going to use a bucket and you're pre-mixing it, I would suggest you mix it, put it in the refrigerator and feed it to them cold and keep it in front of them all the time. We try to offer creep feed to our lambs as soon as we can so that they start nibbling at it. This is our creep feed right here. Um, we want them to start nibbling at that. Because our goal is to get artificially reared lambs weaned as close to 30 days or 30 pounds as we can. Uh, it's just a little bit more cost effective to do it that way. And then we see some compensatory growth from 30 to 60 days that they usually catch up with their, uh, with their, uh, uh, their group of lambs the same age as they are. So uh, with our contemporary group, they usually do pretty good at catching up between 30 and 60 days. So, so these guys are probably on the two and a half, three weeks age list. Uh, we will give them some vaccinations here in a week or so, and then we'll start transitioning them to feed, and we'll probably be weaning them here in about another, oh, another two weeks, I would guess. So. Another question. question yeah, another question. If as you're walking in to see the, of course they want to see the rams and the ewes. So the rams are kind of a big thing here. <laughs> and then during while you're talking about and showing these guys right now. Um, people want to know basically um, how many ewes, how many rams, um, maybe the re, you know, we talked about the breeds. I think that one wanted to know which group, uh, which breed is the most popular, um, but probably just talk about the, how many, how many ewes, how many rams, that sort of stuff right now. Okay. So in our program, and I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me. I had it. I had my inventory actually in front of me. If you'll go grab that, I think I left it in there on the. I can tell you exactly how many we have. And like I said, we're running, we're running the three registered breeds. I know the polypay breed, which is our largest breed and probably our, our most popular breed and the breed that we've been able to sell the most of here recently. As I said, they're very popular in the Midwest because they're a low maintenance, low input, uh, turn out a lot of lambs and they will actually breed readily around, around the year. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the fact that sheep are seasonal breeders while we're out here as well. But, We've got about 130 to 150 polypay ewes right now that produce uh, close to 300 lambs a year or, or over, more than 300 lambs a year. Um, the second breed, as I said, that we've got here are the Hampshire breed. Uh, we're still running pretty close to 50 Hampshire ewes right now. Uh, again, they're not quite prolific, and they're, but they're, you know, if you're in the market lamb breed, if you're looking or if you're in the market lamb pro program where you're showing um, market lambs at counties and state fairs, the Hampshires or the Suffolks or the most of the black faced breeds or crosses therein are the, are the most popular for those shows uh, for the most part. And then of course the Targies, uh, we're, we're down to, we've got just, just under 30 of those and we're actually backing them down to about 12 to 15 head uh, through the summer. We're going to sell quite a few of those and just maintain a small flock to represent the wool industry, wool side of the the industry, but uh, but those are the three breeds. In terms of popularity, you, you kind of have to look at your region and your and what your ultimate goal is to do with them. So, um, you know, you ask about rams. You know, we are doing some 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 out of season breeding, and as I said, um, uh, sheep typically. Oh boy, my phone's getting low on power. I was afraid of that. Um, sheep typically breed. Um, you know, in the in the the fall months to lamb in the spring. Their gestation is roughly five months, just shy of five months. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort to get them to breed this time of year to lamb in the fall. However, the polypays are very readily and easily, easily easier to breed this time of year. So we have got some rams in exposing some ewes. These ewes, if, if we do the math right, these ones with the orange marks on their hips are ewes that have been in heat and the ram has serviced or, or marked today. 
Uh, so they should lamb just shy of five months from today, which I did my, if I did my math correctly, these ewes are due to lamb the first week or two of September for a breeding project that we do and a lambing display that we do at uh, Sheep and Wool Festival the, the week after Labor Day in, in Jefferson, Wisconsin. So that's what these ewes will, will hopefully produce lambs that'll be born down there for a display that we put on at that, that event in September. So hopefully everything works out right and we have some, some new babies about that time of year. Uh, so we've got two groups of hamps and two groups of polypays. Uh, these two poly or these two rams right here in front of me, the hamp ram right here with the, the harness on him and the little guy back in the corner, these were actually just born last year at Sheep and Wool Festival, so in 2019. So these are what we consider lambs, but they are, are mature enough to start breeding and start servicing ewes and producing lambs. Uh, as early as you know these lambs are six seven eight months old at this point so uh, so that's what we got going on in here is is a little bit of of the next generation being produced just as we finish lambing we turn around and, and start all over again so one question was related to um, dorpers and hair sheep obviously that's kind of a a new niche and excitement for some people because then you don't have to shear them and management is a lot easier right. so um, I don't know, somebody had asked if we do research on them or if we do anything like that. Um, you want to comment on that? I'm not sure where you are on a, on a cell phone battery at the moment if you're getting a recharger. But um, Yeah, Lynette went to get a charger. I'll, I'll walk out here and I can comment on that a little bit. Um, we don't, haven't done any hair breed research here. Uh, I did when I was in graduate school. I did some of the early work when the, the Dorpers first came into the U.S and looked at them as a terminal sire. So in other words, we were crossing them on fine wool sheep on whiteface ewes and, and breeding them to raise crossbred lambs and, and comparing them to traditional whiteface ewes and some of the other terminal sire breeds at the time and, and did some work on, on, uh, on you know, seeing how they performed. So the advantage of those two breeds of the Dorpers and the Katahdins is, is they are a hair breeds that do not have to be shorn. Uh, the Katahdins are not docked, so they don't have to dock tails on them. Um, those things, especially nowadays that it's hard to find shearers, uh, are very advantageous. Uh, Katahdins are also thought to be a little bit more parasite resistant. One issue we have in sheep production is, is internal parasites or worms uh, that infect the ewes and, and cause performance data or performance problems and issues. Um, so we do have to, have to be uh, uh, cautious and Hang on, I'm going to try to plug my phone into a battery charger. Okay, hopefully I get some more power now. I think we're good. Um, so those are, those are advantages of the Katahdins and Dorpers. The disadvantage is, especially the Katahdins, they are a little bit slower growing in some of the traditional meat markets. If we want to move them through some of the, the harvest facilities, the larger harvest facilities, they don't typically like the hair breed sheep for a couple of reasons. Number one, they don't tend to grow as quite, quite as big and have as much fat on them. But probably more importantly is one of the biggest sources of income, of supplemental income um, from the harvest of lambs in those big Western plants is the sell of the hides or the pelts. And hair pelts are not worth as much as wool pelts. In fact, they really don't have a market for the hair pelts at all. Uh, the traditional uh, uh, harvest channels sell, sell pelts as, a, as an off-all or as a supplemental project or pro, pro, um, product, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here, uh, and they want a certain amount of, of fiber or wool on them to make them valuable. So, so they haven't, ha you know, they, they haven't hit the, the mainstream harvest channels or the mainstream market yet. Uh, so don't be surprised if you go into those two breeds and try to sell them as commercial sheep through the traditional harvest channels, you're going to get a lower dollar value for your lambs at the end than you might with some of the, with some of the traditional wool breeds. Hopefully that makes sense. So, uh, so we don't do a lot of the research here. If you go into the eastern United States, they're using a lot of Katahdins and doing a lot of the parasite resistance work with Katahdins and seeing how they, you know, the eastern and southeast portion of the United States where the sheep industry is actually growing are seeing a lot of problems with inter internal parasites and our anthelmetics or our drugs that we use to treat those are not effective anymore. So they're looking for other methods to try to uh, are not as effective. So they're looking at other methods to try to protect their sheep from internal parasites. So hopefully that gives you some idea and, and, and explain that a little bit. Does that help, Bernie? Yeah, the one, there was a question about the reader you have that has that special software related to sheep, yep. the weight. Can you want to talk about where you get that one from? That was a common question. Okay, 
So, so we have gone to the RFID program, and those are actually our scrapey, scrapey tags, the little gray tags that we put into those lambs. The one thing that, we, that I didn't talk about is the sheep industry is a little bit ahead of the other, other protein supplement or protein producers in the United States. We have traceability in the sheep industry that a lot of others don't. We actually have an ear tag that all sheep travel around the country with that traces back to our flock. I switched to the RFID tags just this year. That is a, what, what's known as the Shearwell system. I purchased it from, from the Shearwell company, which is actually out of Great Britain. So they are imported out of Great Britain. Um, it's a company that specializes in, in sheep tracking, sheep software, uh, from tags to scale systems to the, the whole works. We use the FarmWorks program that goes along with that to do all of our tracking. Um, you know, everything from treatments to growth rates, to wool growth, to all those kind of things. Um, so that's a new system that I'm still learning. There's still some bugs with it. Most of the bugs are just uh, uh, operator error that I'm trying to figure out. Uh, but it's, it's got some things that I've got to get used to. I've been using a different uh, program for the 20 years that I've been in Wisconsin. So trying to adapt to something new is, you know, teaching an old dog new tricks sometimes. So. Uh, but so far, I'm happy with it. It's just going to speed up uh, input on data, especially collecting weights and performance traits. It's just going to make that all, and, and treatment records, it's going to make that more uh, direct into the computer database instead of having to write it down and, and then transfer it onto a spreadsheet and into a database. So, so that's what that system's about. Uh, it is fairly, uh, fairly new into the United States, but getting used pretty heavily in a lot of commercial flocks out west. It's, I think they're growing their clientele quite a bit in the United States. So. There are other programs out there. True Test makes RFID tags. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different different companies that do it. Uh, I just went with Shearwell because I know they had a reputation of dealing with sheep flocks in in, in particular, and the software programming was already pre-built, and I didn't have to adapt anything different, anything else that that was different than that. So. Todd, before you go too far, can you go back and show the rams in that other pen, unless you plan to show some um, in the across the road? There's a, a few more uh, ram interests. So all of you on the on the call here, make sure you're paying attention right now because he's gonna. There's quite a few rams here in in smaller pens with some of the ewes over here. So um, I will show the rest. Yeah, of the there you go. Later on. So. Oh, okay. Here's, like I said, these are just some of the younger rams that I'm just trying out. A couple of stud, there is a hamp stud. My newest, newest hamp stud, stud ram is back here. Ram that I bought last summer. So, um, so yeah, what was the question? They just wanted to see the rams or? Yeah, there was just lots that wanted to see the rams. So there's a few examples of them in, you know, being put to work so we can have some uh, lambs later on. I've got three pins of rams across the road that as we as we end we'll we'll end in those three pins probably. So so I'm gonna walk across the road, Bernie, if you wanna talk about a few other things or I can talk about pastures and facilities a little bit more as we walk. It's just a little harder to watch on the video. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, there's a lot of questions about your vaccination program. So I don't know if you were going to talk about that across the way, but that that in the shoot system are two things that are of interest. So we hey. can table those. Um, but yep. do you want to talk a little bit about your wool marketing? Um, there were some questions about how you market your wool and, and all of that that when we get into the I've got some places set out and and yeah we're going to talk a little bit about wool in specific when we get into the workroom okay so, um, hold on to those questions hold on to those questions okay the other just for in general use people were asking and I kind of answered the question just privately but people had asked if, if animals can get the coronavirus and as of right now um, there is some research going on to try and figure that out but for the most part, what is being seen is that uh, coronavirus is not a zoonotic disease related to domestic animals from humans. Um, they are looking into like pets and dogs and cats, um, but right now it's not really conclusive like they for sure, but right now it looks pretty certain that uh, it can't go from human to uh, domestic animals like sheep and pigs and poultry and and cattle so um since it's new for humans it's kind of new and kind of figuring out it what it what it all can uh show up in so um you know for that question that's about what i can a answer um i think some of the questions related to what um were in the chat were some of the things todd's going to 
kind of cover over here. Um, yes, Todd and I love to judge sheep and love to show and love um, being in uh, this, uh, this kind of world of agriculture and showing and teaching you all about animals, but also we kind of grew up in this. So um, it's, it's kind of been our, our love and livelihood here from, from the beginning. So I'm kind of rambling here a little bit just to kind of pick up some picture or pick up some statements here. Um, so I'm going to ask, does this go towards uh, points for showing and selling in 4-H? Um, I will, or I do have, um, we'll have a spreadsheet of this at the end. Um, and if you um, identify your county and tell your county people that you went to this, I can certainly send them the spreadsheet so they can, um, get you kind of checked off um, or at least make you identified that um, we we have you down. Um, let's see, what makes a good show lamb? Well, that we could talk all day on, I that, think. That would be a whole other <laughs> webinar. Yeah, how many acres are, is here at the sheep, that is the sheep okay. unit? So that's a good question. I was gonna talk a little bit about that as I walked over, but I uh, uh, didn't wanna talk over the top of Bernie, but I'll kind of project back out the window here so you can kind of see the, the landscape. Um, I sent out a, a fact sheet and I think Bernie was gonna share that and you talk about the vaccination protocol. I did put together a, a sheep health preventative vaccine program, uh, cheat sheet, so to speak. It's a two page document that I think Bernie can attach towards the tail end of this as well. I don't mind sharing that with people. Um, and, and on that fact sheet, it, it talks about our, our pastures. We run on about 60, just over 60, almost 66 acres, I believe, is what I added up last night looking at my map one more time. Um, we are right on the, on the county line between Dane County that I'm in right now. The other barn was in Columbia County, so the gravel road, the blacktop road, or excuse me, the, the blacktop road out here uh, is the county line and, and splits us, splits us uh, uh, into half, uh, and we have almost the acre split in half as well. Uh, there's probably a few more acres on the north side or on in the Columbia County line sign, side than, than the Dane, Dane County side, but, uh, but we have, I don't remember how many pastures it is uh, split up into, but I've further split them, and if you look at that map a little bit, you can kind of see what I've done. Uh, we have five pastures on the east side of the, the barns, or out that direction, out on the other side of the silos and on the other side of this barn that I'm in right now, uh, that are long and narrow and easy to divide off. And I've buried underground water lines out there and I've invested in some electronet fencing that I can use to cross fence, fence those and, and mob graze or strip graze or rotationally graze those pastures. And I can put as many as, oh, 50 to 100 ewes in each strip and then move them about every two to three days and it's really increased our grazing season substantially over the years to be able to do that. So, uh, so we do quite a bit of rotational grazing here. Um, our ewes live on grass the majority of the year. Uh, we don't feed our ewes, we don't supplement our ewes with a lot of hay or a lot of grain, other than just during gestation, late gestation and through lactation. Otherwise, if we've got plenty of grass, they're out on pasture and they're running on pasture um, most of the months of the year. So. Usually from about November through April, we might have to have to feed in the barns, um, but usually by the 1st of May. Uh, this year, we're a little bit behind, it seems like. The grasses really haven't shot up like I was hoping they would by now, um, but I would anticipate in a couple of weeks, we'll be able to start turning out some smaller groups on, on pasture as we wean lambs. We've got one group of ewes on the west end of that north barn that we raised January lambs and have weaned and all of those ewes that we just looked at are ewes that'll be bred for fall and then they'll go out on pasture as soon as they're bred. So, uh, so those, are, those are in the works right now. We're just looking for a good warm uh, few days for the grass to grow and then we'll be about back out on pasture pretty quickly. Did I get that one answered, Bernie? Yeah, I think go ahead with where you're going here and, and okay. if you can include the shoot so, system and the vaccinations, that'd be great. Yep. yep. So on this side, this is our general housing barn and I always like to quiz somebody and, and see how long you think this barn is. So I'll let a few people put, this is the one barn that was built specifically for the sheep barn. The north barn that we were in, when the university moved up here in the 60s, in the late, in the mid 60s, they redesigned that barn. I believe it was hogs before the sheep units came in here. 
Um, but when this ground was built and purchased and all these buildings were bought, were, were put here, a lot of the buildings were converted from old farmsteads, uh, which is the North Barn was, was the old farmstead that the university bought the, the place from. This barn was built specifically for the sheep program back in the 60s. We had, we've got a 572 feet, we've got a 500 feet. 500's close, a little bit too long. So we have, this barn is about 400 or right at 420 feet. And when it was built, it was built 42 pins that were 10 foot wide. So each one of these post sections were a pin. And you can see over the years, it's been redesigned, remodeled and, and uh, 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 you know, just, just completely uh, changed over the years. And we, we, I've, I've done a lot of remodeling in it just in the 20 years that I've been here putting in all the portable paneling outside, opening it up a lot more so it's easier to get in and clean, um, easier to take care of, uh, and we can stock it a little bit better as well. Uh, the one thing in the winter time is this barn does get very cold. Uh, so we do put a windbreak up on it in the front on the south facing section. That's looking out to the south. You're looking out to the south right now out of our pastures on the south side of the barn. Uh, it gets, gets pretty cold and windy in here in the winter time. And it gets to be a wind tunnel up here in the speed alleyway when when the wind's blowing. So we we seal her up pretty tight in the winter time with a windbreak and there's a curtain that comes down. You probably can't see it, but it comes down on top of the plywood windbreaks to seal this up in the winter time. So when we bring babies over here in January and February, they're very very well protected. This group of lambs you see right here, this is a majority. We've got two big pins of these used. These are our polypase. Uh, there's about uh, 90 of them in here that had pretty close to 160 or 180 lambs in February and, and half of them are in this pen and half of them will be in a pen two or three pins down the road um, and like I said these are due to be uh, vaccinated again here in another week to 10 days and probably be weaned in about two and a half two to two and a half weeks we will wean them so uh, so we bring them over here in small groups after they come out of the lambing room on the north side transfer them over here in a, in a crate that I have on the front of our skid loader. We bring the lambs over and the ewes typically follow, uh, just come right across the road. The only issue we have is if it's icy, we might haul them in a trailer, but otherwise these maternal ewes will typically follow their lambs wherever you take them. So we move them that way. Uh, it works pretty good to move them a few at a time. So this barn is set up to mostly feed ewes. You can see it's got a bunk down the inside that we can feed. Um, most sheep are fed dry forages. Now, Sheep are a ruminant animal, so they live on dry forages. That's why they can, or, or on, on forages in general. They live on grass or hay, um, or a hay grass mix, and don't need as much grain, as much concentrate as say pigs or poultry would need. Uh, just like beef cattle, they can live on pretty much a straight uh, all forage diet. Uh, we do feed ours a wet hay on the north side, a wrapped baleage. So it's been fermented a little bit because it's put up with a little bit more moisture in it than what a dry hay would be put up in. Um, and then we feed them uh, alfalfa chopped haylage that you saw the two big silos. I tried to show you those as I walked across the road. They fill those silos with chopped hay out of the fields here on the station uh, once a year. Uh, they fill those for me. And then we feed out of those with a feed cart. It's down at the other end of the barn. We fill that feed cart a couple of times every morning and, and put it in these J bunks right here. And the ewes can come up and eat their, eat their haylage out of this, out of this J bunk. Now this little section right here, and I've got one of these in, in each pen, uh, is a little bit different. Okay, so the ewes, they don't need a lot. They get the haylage and I'll show you their diet here in a minute. We'll go ahead and look at it, but I'll walk by and you can see some of these, what we call creep pens. Some of these creep pens right here. Um, these lambs need a little bit more nutrients to grow. We want them to grow fast. We want them to, to grow uh, 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 efficiently. And in order to do that, they need a little bit more feed than mom. Just like, uh, uh, you know, my boys, they need a little bit more higher energy and higher uh, protein and higher uh, mineral and vitamin source than maybe I do. If I, if I eat what we feed them when they're little, we just get fatter and fatter and fatter because we're done growing. But these little guys, we want them to keep growing. So we got to feed them a little bit better. So the ewes, let's see, I guess I can go ahead and start here. This is our, what we call our creep feed. And we build these pens right here that these lambs can come in and eat out of these self feeders. And that feed is there 24 seven. They can get as much of it as they want to consume. This is what it looks like. It's a, actually a pelleted feed, but it's got a lot of protein supplement in it in the form of soybean meal, but it's also got some corn for energy. And then it's got some vitamin and mineral packs as well, okay? So that's what, 
that's what we get our lambs started on. And we want them to start eating this as young as possible. Now they don't have the ability to digest it when they're little. That's why they live on mom's milk. It usually takes them two weeks for their rumen to start developing so that they can, get, they can digest this. But they'll nibble and play in it, you know, as early as four or five days. Then by, by you know, 10 days to two weeks, they might start utilizing some of this and be able to digest it. So that's, we want to give them something that's very digestible, very palatable. This has got a little bit more dust in it than I'd like to have. Um, but that's just kind of a product of the, the augers and stuff that we run it through to get it to the, to the lambs that breaks it up a little bit. So that's the first diet that they start on. The ewes, however, like I said, they can live pretty much on straight forage or straight, straight roughage with just a little bit of energy supplement to keep them milking well. Um, so their diet is pretty much a whole shell corn and what looks like a salad essentially or a a uh, chopped alfalfa, like I said, and I'll show you that in this next feed part. So this is what we feed the ewes. It's just whole shell corn right off of the cob, right out of the field, dry. Um, you know, not, not, a, not any processing to it. We just try to get it down and we give them about a, a pound of this a day, half, to, half a pound to one pound a day when they're on the north side prior to lambing. And then we up them to about two pounds a day while they're feeding their lambs over here on this side of the, of the road. And then they get this chopped alfalfa hay. So this is just alfalfa hay out of the hay field, chopped up and put in the silo. And we feed that to them once a day. And uh, somebody asked how much they eat. Um, this stuff, if you let them eat all they want, it's not a, it wouldn't surprise me for you to eat 10 to 12 pounds of it a day. Uh, they really only need about six to eight pounds of it, depending on the feed quality. Uh, and the size of your ewe, uh, chopped alfalfa hay, they're going to eat about six to eight pounds of it is what they need. Uh, whereas if you're feeding them good quality alfalfa that's dry, they only need about four to four and a half pounds of it. And again, that's going to vary from breed and from the size of the ewe and the, and the condition they're in and how many lambs that they uh, are, are raising as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at on that. Now, you know, that's the ewe diet and the starter lamb diet. We do have a couple of other diets that we feed and we keep things pretty simple here. We don't have a lot of diets. I know some programs that have four or five different feed rations that they feed their sheep. Uh, we've got one other ration that we feed and that's this one. This is our finishing and growing ration that we use on lambs. Uh, again, it's a whole grain diet. It's got whole shell corn, whole oats, and then there's a pellet in there that's their protein supplement. So we go from about a 19% protein on that pellet that I showed you earlier that we start them on down to this, it's about a 13%. We do have one other transition in the middle. We have another diet that's about 16%, but I don't have anything on it right now. Uh, so I don't have any of that to show you, but this is what we use to, uh, uh, to grow ewe lambs, grow ram lambs and finish out our, our uh, fat lambs that we send to, to market uh, usually in the late summers and early fall. So. Um, you know, again, the amount that we feed them varies from, from stage of production. Um, the lambs, when we wean them off of that creep ration at about 60 days of age, they're probably eating about, I would guess, uh, three to five pounds of this pellet is what they're eating when we wean them at about 60 days. Um, and then we'll self feed them again and again. Like I said, it might not be uncommon for a hundred pound lamb to, to consume five to six pounds of grain plus a little bit of hay every day as, as they're growing and finishing out in the summer and early fall. How are we doing, Bernie? Sorry, I gotta get myself off mute. Um, some, you know, one question was why is it chopped, some of the feed? Um, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle that? That's a good question. The biggest reason for chopping it is make it a touch more digestible. Uh, it's a little easier for the bugs in the rumen and, and you know, ruminant animals have the ability to digest coarser roughages than what non-ruminants have because they have the bacteria in the rumen that help them break that down. But by chopping it, it makes it even a little bit more digestible. So we feed chopped hay uh, during lactation just because it takes the ewe a little bit less effort and a little bit less energy to digest it and turn and convert it into, into milk production for the lambs. Plus it comes through our equipment a little bit better. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fine to feed sheep dry stemmy hay or dry long, I shouldn't say stemmy hay, but dry long stem hay. Again, you know, you want to save your best quality for it just to feed during, for sure during lactation and, and probably those last two to three weeks of late gestation as well. Uh, Cause that's when they're really growing a lot of fetuses and put a lot of their, 
their nutrients into milk production. So you wanna make it as easy for that conversion to happen as possible. So the higher quality of the feed is, the more digestible it is, the more important it is to feed it at that point. Then other times of the year, sheep don't need a real high quality forage. You can feed some pretty marginal hays to sheep and get by just fine. Um, you know, longer stem hay, grassy hays, uh, especially during, during uh, a dry up, you know, we'll start drying these ewes up here in a couple of weeks. What I mean by that is we want to have those lambs start to, to nurse those ewes out and, and get the milk out of them so that when we wean them, there's not a lot of, of uh, uh, residual milk left in those udders that can go bad as, as if the lambs aren't there to, to clean it out of them. So we'll put them on a, on a drier hay, a stemier hay that has less nutrients in it so that those ewes aren't producing as much milk as we get closer to, to weaning. And then after weaning, we for sure want to feed them dry hay or even some straw, something just to, to keep their bellies full, but let that milk process and the, that, that milk production dwindle down to next to nothing um, as they dry up. So, uh, so the, the hay quality for sheep is, is not as critical as it is for cattle or dairy cattle, uh, except for, I would say, during during lactation and late gestation, you want to be careful of feeding them as, as good a quality hay. It doesn't have to be hot, top quality dairy quality hay, but a good quality alfalfa or alfalfa grass mix is, is definitely a plus uh, during those points. And then the rest of the times of the year, uh, as long as you're feeding them an adequate supply, it doesn't have to be a high quality uh, to keep sheep, sheep going. And that's why pasture is, is really good for sheep because, you know, they can survive on, on, uh, uh, grass just fine. They don't need a lot of supplemental grain. Other questions? That, no, that I think. The top hay question? Yeah, I think um, if you move into, you know, your shoot system and that, those are kind of the next questions. And, um, you know, it's just 10 after two, just wanted to make sure you kind of were aware of time. No, we're, we're moving. Yeah, I figured it was going to go well over. So, so one thing I did that, and it's just mostly because of the volume of sheep that we we have is, you know, one thing I did when I first got here, and hopefully you can still hear me over the boys sharing, um, is develop in a working in a working system that's that's very flexible. Uh, this 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 shoot system was purchased back in probably 2002. It was one of the first investments I made when I got here. Um, was put this shoot system up, and it's easily to convert. It's got a scale in it. It's got a couple of shearing gates in it. When I bring in commercial shearing crew, which my boys are not commercial shearers, but well, I shouldn't say that they actually do have their own shearing business. But um, uh, you know, but we do have a crew that comes in from up north that does most of our shearing that we don't do in our shearing school. Um, so you know, these the, this shoot system makes it very easy and and pretty uh, easy to handle and and a lot easier to and safer for the sheep as well. So. Not everybody's gonna have this, not everybody's gonna be able to invest in this, and it's not that you necessarily need it, um, but for us, for the volume of sheep that we work and the amount of times we work them, it's, it's very, very nice and very handy to have this. So um, I don't know if anybody's, if everybody on here has ever seen a sheep shorn commercially or not, but I'm gonna talk through the boys shearing here. You know, like I said, these are my two boys. They've been doing quite a bit of shearing for their FFA SAEs over the last four or five years. Both of them took shearing schools here that we put on every every winter. Um, both of them have learned how to do this uh, pretty efficiently. We'll see if we can keep from making them nervous here, being that they're they're on on TV, but um, or on the computer. But uh, shearing is something that has to be done with sheep, as we talked about the domestication. The wool continues to grow, and once these guys get done shearing these two ewes, I'll talk a little bit more about wool. But it doesn't just fall off sheep like it does in other species. It does not shed. And it's very strong. And in a lot of breeds, it's very dense. And the longer it gets, the more it makes the sheep become uh, immobile. They're not going to be able to move. They're not going to be able to take care of themselves if we let it grow. So we do physically have to take it off. And there isn't a real easy way to do it without learning how to do it as a trade and doing it you know, one stroke at a time with a set of clippers. Um, you know, it takes some practice to learn how the positions were developed years and years and years ago. Um, this is the Australian version here that these boys are using. Um, the, the patterns are designed so that the wool comes off safely and the, they continue, continue to see where they're at on the sheep, um, keep them from, from making uh, uh, any kinds of nicks on the, on the hide from wrinkles and things like that. It's easier on the, on the shearer's body and the body of the sheep. 
um, and the wool comes off in one piece, so it can be utilized for a lot of different things. So I think they're in a race here. I don't know, but they're having fun, I can tell. So something to do. This is their physical education for the day. So Hayden's going to get uh, physical education credit for Sharon today, I hope. So get you another one, Hayden. Yeah. <laughs> I've just been answering some of the questions in the chat box for the most part, Todd. Um, I'm just trying to find one that I didn't know I had. I can barely hear you. Hang on. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I guess I was just trying to find a question that I didn't know how to answer. Um, but I'm pretty much getting most of the questions in the, in the um, chat box as we're going here. Um, Let's see, Huber, the Huber family does the, the sheep unit shearing, right? For most- Yes, yes. and they also are our, our lead, shear, our lead uh, um, crew that comes in and does most of our commercial shearing, yeah. The Hubers from up at Wisconsin Dells, Joe Huber and his boys, um, two of the three boys are married and one of them moved to Iowa. So um, they're a little bit uh, short of labor right now as well. So he struggles sometimes getting some of the bigger jobs done and my boys have gone with Joe and Sean on a couple of bigger jobs so uh, but they are still sharing yes and then there was a question about the brand of feed um, and do you want we'll talk about the feed mill um, that the unit has at the end of the last session in May but um, do you want to talk how you and the sheep unit inter, inter, integrate with the feed mill say that again Bernie the feed mill yeah, how, where, what brand, they asked what brand of feed, but obviously um, you get a lot of it from within the unit and the feed mill yeah. right there on Our the feed, research. We don't, we don't buy a commercial feed here at the station. Our feed is all from the pellet, from that protein pellet, the whole works. We've worked those rations out, uh, used a couple of different calculators and, and uh, uh, we, we, uh, uh, make all of ours right here at the feed mill. And I think one of our later virtual tours is going to be on so, it would, because uh, normal you would be seven. Yeah, so you'll lay them. Uh, helping me put together some really, really yeah. good rations. Yeah. For our so, we've been really happy with those rations. All right. Um, let's see. There was, do you have any health problems with the Targis in the environment in Wisconsin versus out west where it's drier and less humid? Say that again. I think I'm uh -huh. having with my earbuds. Are you hearing me on my ear on, yep. on the phone? Yeah, we're hearing you just fine. Um, okay. Yeah, there was just there was just a question about the health problems um, or anything. Do you have health problems with the targies because it's more humid than it is out west? Not that I've noticed in the last four or five years. The first few years I was here, I had more mastitis issues, probably in the targies and the polys and the hamps and even the rambolays. Um, a lot of that was is at that time we didn't have as prolific of flocks and we had more milk production than what the lambs were taking out of those udders and we were running into some some just too much milk and if you can have that we had run into some too much some use of too much milk and they were having mastitis so uh, health issues probably the biggest issue we have here right now is is foot issues in the spring and through the fall when we get a lot of rain uh, we've been, been fighting foot scald, and, and I don't see a lot of limping going on right now, fortunately. Um, but uh, uh, we're, we're starting to get ahead of it, but it's taken us a few years to find a treatment regime. And, and uh, uh, you know, that is all in that, in that document that I put together, how we handle that. Um, so that's something that maybe if you're interested in that, either email Bernie or myself, and, and we can get that out to you or we can share it. Uh, it can be shared on on the you know the FYI page for that matter. So uh, so health wise, no. I mean, like I said, you know, in the lambs, the biggest issues we have to watch for, of course, are starvation. Like anybody, mismothering usually causes starvation. Um, you know, and and then pneumonia as well. And knock on wood, as crazy as the weather's been this year, we have not had the pneumonia issues that we've had some, some past years. So uh, so those are probably the three biggest things. You know, mastitis and foot scald in the ewes are the two biggest things there. And then uh, starvation and, and pneumonia are the two biggest ones with the lamb. Um, do you have the donkey? Wool for a little bit. Yep, that sounds good. 
So, so like I said, you know, we do have to shear these ewes twice or once a year. Some breeds they might shear twice a year, and I did set out some fleeces to talk a little bit about. So these are two of our Targi stud bucks right here. Uh, these are two that we sheared back about, uh, oh, it's been a little over a month ago. These were shorn in March. Um, this fleece, somebody asked about pounds of wool. This fleece weighed 12 to 15, 12 pounds skirted, probably 15 pounds before I skirted it. Um, and I don't know what this one weighed, but it was a little bit lighter, still about 12 pounds. A good Targi ram will shear as much as 20 pounds a year uh, at one shearing. Um, so, so yeah, the, the fleeces can get very heavy. These lambs, these are our lambs that were born in the fall that the boys are shearing. They're probably shearing off five to six pounds. The Targis are probably shearing off five to six pounds of wool. The, the Polly's probably four to five and the Hamps three to four pounds of wool uh, when we shear them this early. Uh, so these are being shorn this time of year so that they grow a little bit more as we get warm in the spring and summer. Um, so, you know, we're just getting the, the baby wool knocked off of them so that the fleeces we shear at a year of age are a little bit better for them. So, so and then this is a Hampshire ram here. Uh, we talk about what we use wool for. Um, you know, the, the high quality wools are typically used for clothing, lower quality wools maybe for felts and carpets and seat covers. Um, ultimately, we want fine, white, long stapled wool. Pull me a staple out of there, Lynette. I can't do it one handed. So, um, just pull a staple. So, that's a staple of wool. So, this is like I said, the fleece off of one ram. This is how long that fleece was. At a year's, year's time, we'll lay it down on the table. That's probably pretty close to three and a half inches staple length, maybe even four inches fairly fine. That place is going to be very usable for high quality fabric and high quality clothing. The other thing about it is it is white. So when we when we make yarn out of it, we can dye it any color. Here's a black face fleece. This is off of a hemp. And this is what I want you to notice right here. This part right here. And there's several spots in this fleece. I laid this one out on the table. This is the dirty side up. So this is the side that came off of the, the outer side of the sheep. And if we roll it over, you can see the underside here. But this is a Hampshire. It's coarser, it's shorter stapled, and it's got all this black fiber contamination in it. So it's not gonna be as usable for clothing manufacturers and things like that. So it's a little bit um, harder to, to, to use and harder to, to get a lot of value out of black face wool clip as it is the whiter, whiter white face wool. A couple of things that I like to point out about wool. Um, one thing is, is it's, you know, it's, it's got some advantages over some of the other fibers. Or the biggest thing is it's got some definite advantages over some of the other fibers. First one is, and um, the first one is, is the strength of it. Wool is extremely strong. It, it's really hard to, to break it. Uh, you can make some really strong, very usable, very useful yarns out of it. Um, I'm going to go out here and I'll, I'll have the boys keep sharing and I'll talk out here where it's a little bit quieter and talk a little bit more about wool. Can you still hear, hear me, Bernie? Yep, we still can. Okay, so we talk about wool and what we use wool for. Like I said, clothing is probably the biggest one and a lot of the reasons that they like it for clothing is the strength and the durability of it. Uh, very long or very, very strong, very durable and very warm, but it's also very, very cool in the summertime. Anybody know why it's cool? What's a trait of wool that makes it a, a summer fiber as much as a winter fiber? Anybody want to gander it? Oops, I'm dropping my phone. Sorry about that. Oops. Thank go you. ahead and go ahead and put it in the chat box if you can. Hang on, I screwed up. Okay, back to meeting. Hang on. We can. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, you can still hear me. Yep. There we go. All right, we're back looking at these shorn yep. ewes. Yep. Okay. So strength and durability, warmth, but it's also very cool in the summertime because it has a property known as wicking. Does anybody know what it, if you know what it, what it means to wick is it means it keeps you dry. It actually gives off moisture. Uh, the largest user of domestic wool in the United States is our U.S. military. They use wool fiber for everything from their uh, dress uniforms to their um, coats and hats and all the way down to their socks and believe it or not, t-shirts and underwear. And uh, they actually developed a t-shirt that was uh, fitted into the U.S. military that served in Afghanistan and Iraq, and you wouldn't think of them wanting to use wool to wear in the desert and hot climate. But because it stays so dry, it actually keeps those guys cooler in those hot, arid climates than a cotton t-shirt was because it's, it keeps them dry when they sweat because it wicks. 
So if you make it thin enough and make it out of fine enough wool, uh, it can be very cool in the summertime as well as keep you warm in the winter. I've gotten to where I wear wool socks almost year round because the wool in the summertime keeps, keeps my feet much drier than what cotton athletic socks do when I sweat working in the, in the heat in the summertime. So, so wool is, is very good for that. Uh, the other advantage to it is, is the reason that it's a lot of times find, fought and found not only in military clothing, but also firefighting clothing, as well as baby clothes and baby blankets. If you can think about that, the reason that is, is because it's fire retardant, or it will not ignite under, under uh, flames. So it's got some ability to, to keep you protected if you get into a fire in situation. So, so wool, wool will not ignite as well. And then the last thing I always like to point out is wool is probably the most renewable fabric we have out there. I would say, you know, next to cotton, it probably is the, uh, the other renewable fabric. These sheep continue to grow wool year in and year out. Every year we harvest, you know, 10 to 20 pounds of wool that can go into, into be used, used for clothing manufacture and it grows right back without harming the animal one bit. I don't see uh, any, any cuts or any blemishes on any of these sheep. The boys are shorn to this part and they'll, they'll keep growing and we'll take it off of them again a year from now and use it all over again. And in terms of an animal that has a, a pretty small carbon footprint, you know, they're, they're taking care of the land and, the, and the, 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 the environment for us as well as anything out there. And they're doing it and raising something that we can utilize from year in and year out as well. So I really like the, the future of sheep being able to to continue to graze and continue to produce a high quality fabric and fiber for us that can be utilized for years and years and years to come. Questions on wool? They want to know where you sell it and what it goes, what, what most, um, what do you, where, um, in what part of the industry is it going to get uh, sold? Okay. So most of our wools, we probably don't get a lot for because the two breeds that we raise that, to the biggest extent are the polyphase and the hamp. Uh, the polyphase, if we did a little bit more selection and, and, and we're a little bit more uh, uh, stringent on, on selecting for wool growth in general, we could get some money for the fleeces off of them. And we do get a little bit of, of, of uh, wool checks for our, our polyphase. The hamps we don't get much for. But the targies, if I market it right, and most of it is niche marketed to hand spinners, you know, we can get as much as uh, uh, 3 to $4 a pound for some of that high quality wool. So on a 10 pound fleece, we might get $40 for um so so there is some income in the in the targies not so much in the polys and the hams most of our wool if you saw in there uh, uh that big bagger in the center of the room in there the boys were throwing the, these fleeces in it goes into those big big uh, plastic bags those uh i think they're seven or eight foot high um you know we pack that down in there it holds about 200 and or about 150 to 200 pounds of wool it's packaged and shipped to a wool warehouse in ohio and then the commercial producers come in and bid on it and buy it as they need it for different different projects. The high quality wools, most of the wool manufacturers that make uh, clothing fiber are on either either the coasts. Uh, one of the largest ones I think is in North Carolina right now. And so a lot of our high quality wools are, are, are sold and, and shipped that direction or it's shipped overseas to, to inter, for international trade to, to uh, producer or to manufacturers overseas that, that do a little bit more work with our wool, with the higher quality wool. So again, like I said, we don't, you know, the, the sale of wool isn't our biggest source of income. Uh, the biggest source of income for us is selling breeding stock. And I can talk a little bit about that as we go down here. Maybe we'll go stand in the ram pen and I can talk a little bit more about that. Any other questions on wool? No, I think that's it. Um, I think we're kind of caught up on questions. So yeah, if you want to hit kind of the last parts, I guess the only other thing was predators. I don't know if you still have the donkey around to show or if that's in the vicinity. No, unfortunately, we, we lost our last donkey last fall. So oh, don't. no. Okay. I can talk about it. So this pen of lambs I'm walking past right here are January born lambs. And, you know, a lot of you probably wonder how fast they grow. Um, these lambs, like I said, were born in the middle, the end of January. Um, we weaned them roughly 60 days of age, and most of them weighed from 60 to 75 pounds at that time. The hamps on the heavy side, you know, they were closer to that 70, 75 pounds at that time. Uh, there's some lambs in here that'll be pushing 100 pounds pretty quick. Uh, we'll weigh them a couple more times before we start to make some management decisions on who we're going to keep and who we're going to sell. But that's a group of February or first group of January lambs. There are a few Februarys in here. I talked about the orphans that we raised. 
they're all mixed into this pen. The ones that we weaned at 30 days, there's some, there's a few little ones laying right there chewing their cud right next to the water tank. Uh, the, the, the blue things, for those of you that wonder, that don't know a lot about sheep facilities, those blue uh, pedestals in the center of these pens, that's their automatic waters. These sheep have, have fresh water in front of them all the time. So there's a group of orphan lambs laying right there next to that one that were weaned in, in, uh, uh, in just about three weeks ago. Uh, this pen I used right here, these are our younger lambs. These are the tail end of our lambing. These are polypay ewes that lambed in the month of March. So there's lambs in here that are, you know, from two weeks to, to four or five weeks of age, um, just growing and doing good. The interesting thing about these ewes are these are our first time lammers. These ewes were actually all born a year ago. So these were born in January, February, and March of 2019, were bred in the fall in October, November, to lamb in March and early April as, as a year of age, or just between 12 and 14 months of age. That's pretty common practice in the polypay breed, not maybe as much in some of the other breeds. They let those ewes grow out a little bit more before they breed them to lamb the first time as two-year-olds. Uh, but we like to have our polypay ewes lamb right at as close to a year of age as we can. So that's what that group of ewes are. So we'll walk down here to the end of the barn and I'll get in with our, our stud bucks or our older bucks. Uh, I know there's been some people asking about rams uh, and they're all down here on the end of the barn. Typically this time of year, because the rams get a little bit bored when they're not a lot of uh, uh, ewes around and a lot of action for them, they get bored and get destructive and like to beat things up and beat each other up. So we a lot of times like to keep them in a different location. Um, but right now they're down here um, in these last three pens. These are the fall born ram lambs that were born last October, September, October. Uh, this group are yearling rams that were born a year ago. And then this group down here are our stud rams, the rams that we've got around for breeding purposes that will go in and we'll get some ewes bred to them. Um, oh, probably the next couple of weeks for fall lambs and then we'll use them heavy this fall for next year's spring lamb crop. So there's all three breeds are represented in here. Uh, of course, the two hamp bucks right here in front of us, the two big rams in the back are our two targy, targy stud rams. And then we've got the two polypay rams in here as well. So these are, these are our rams. So as I said, we're, our program is geared to, to try to um, assist the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences with research teaching. And then we do a lot of outreach. Um, we do some research projects out here, not quite as many going on right now as some of the other units, but we do have a couple. Those two pins of polypays I talked about earlier are on a three or four or five year uh, uh, generational interval project, a genetics study that we're doing that uh, somebody's interested in. I can go more in detail on that later on or, or privately if you want. Um, but then we do a lot of teaching and outreach and education programs with them. Uh, these rams right here, you know, are representative of some pretty uh, valuable genetics that we've been able to sell the last few years. We sell a lot of females and, and bucks nationwide out of this flock based on their ability to produce and perform the next generation. So, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of questions. Do we sell breeding stock or do we sell sheep? Yes, we do. We sell everything from feeder lambs to fat lambs to, as I said, buck prospects and even replacement ewe lambs. As I tell a lot of people when they come to our facilities, it's a pretty good life to be born, at least on the female side in this flock, because there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna be kept as a breeding piece in either our flock or be sold to another flock that's gonna use you as a breeding female as well. And on the ram side, you know, we probably sell 80 to 85 of our ewe lambs that hit the ground, either keep them for our own use or sell them to other producers. On the ram side, we probably sell upwards of 30% of our rams as either either uh, commercial range rams throughout the Midwest and into the western states or as stud buck prospects to other breeding programs they're trying to do the same um, type of breeding program as what we have here. So we're part of what's known as the National Sheep Improvement Program or NSIP uh, which is a program that develops estimated breeding values uh, for sheep similar to EPDs that you would see in cattle and some in hogs as well. So we sell the majority of our sheep with data for performance traits intact or, or in, included in their pedigree, so to speak. Uh, so there's a lot of people that buy rams from me or ewe lambs from me just based on their performance and productivity, uh, trying to get to the next generation. So yes, we do sell quite a few sheep through this flock. 
Uh, this whole pen of yearling rams right here are probably bucks that we will uh, work on marketing through the spring and summer. And then the fall rams are the same way. And then we'll start going through the January, February and March lambs and, and making some uh, uh, selection uh, and, and try to put together some, some sale, sale lists. And, and uh, I've got a couple of sale opportunities through the summer that if they don't get canceled, we will travel to some. But I'm also entering the, the times of, of internet online auctions. And I've got two sales scheduled for the summer for June this year that I've got to get in gear and get some, some things done for that. So, so there are opportunities to buy uh, sheep from the from the university sheep program. Questions, Bernie? Well, I think that pretty much wraps up the questions, Todd. I think the only one um, I, I did guess not there... talk about the predators, and I, I we did yeah. have two donkeys at one time that we ran. We do, you know, sheep are an easily preyed upon species. Uh, you can see our pastures are fenced with net wire, and that helps to deter coyotes and and such from getting in, but they will still dug, dig underneath the fence. Um, the electric fence that we use to separate the pastures help as well. And then we used to run donkeys with our sheep. We had two jennies that we, we ran with them and just their presence here helped keep the, the predators at bay. Uh, I know other programs that use guard dogs. I know other programs that use llamas. Uh, a lot of different predator, predator controls that can run with sheep. Uh, but we, we haven't gone any, we haven't even replaced our two donkeys yet. They were pretty old, had some, some issues the last couple of years. We've lost both of them in the last three or four years, but I'm guessing they were 20 plus years old and had lived here for 20 years, you know, a pretty easy life while they were running, running with the sheep. So. All right. Well, thanks for that, Todd. I think I'm going to just share my screen and kind of round up unless you had something else you wanted to add. Nope, that's fine. Okay, so um, we'll stay online so we can kind of close it up together. But here online, guys, is what Todd was talking about. Um, this is, um, and, and you'll receive the link to this webpage um, when we follow, follow up um, here in a little bit. Um, so here are some of the helpful, those materials that Todd was talking about, the fact sheet in Todd's health schedule that many of you were asking about his vaccination program, and then that picture of the sheep pastures. Um, I also included some youth activities. There's a, a, a number of things of crossword puzzles and breeds of sheep and lots of different things that you can uh, do while you're at home to learn more about sheep. There's even a paper sheep craft uh, that you can do that I'm going to have my boys do here um, as well at home. So uh, take the advantage of doing that and then uh, do follow up. You will receive an email from me that has about five questions to do a survey. So Todd and I and the other farm center managers would love for you to complete those surveys so we have a better idea on um, you know, how you liked it. Would you like more of these types of things? Um, you know, I really appreciate the, the unit man managers coming on board with my harebrained idea and um, making this really educational for you all. So uh, thanks, Todd, today. Uh, not only uh, Todd, but um, his family. So if you want to switch your camera around, Todd, we can see your face. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. You can see your face and, and, and not your knee, yeah. So uh, rounding up today, you guys, we really appreciate you being on board. Boy, at one point we had 207 people on here, Todd. So um, I think because of you and the unit, we attracted a lot of good, good folks today. So I'll let you have the last word. Uh, thanks for being uh, here, Todd. And uh, you can say any last words and round us up for the day. I, I can do that. So again, I appreciate everybody that that uh, joined us, and and hopefully you you know I was able to to touch it enough for for all the different uh, stages or levels of of sheep producers that we had, from novice to to maybe a few of you that have been at it for a while, picked up some things. And you know I am a sheep resource in the state of Wisconsin and in the in the Upper Midwest. I don't have a full extension appointment. I am more of a program manager and here to take care of the sheep unit for the department but I take calls and emails and try to get back to you as, as I can. And if there's anything I can do to help, um, you know, we get over this, this quarantine business and, you know, we are here for people to come view and, and visit. Uh, like right, right now we are shut down just like everybody else in the country is, you know, and my family is shut down, but they're able to come out and help me. And so I was glad they were here today to help us with this. But uh, uh, you know, I, hopefully I was, I was, 
informative enough for you to, to learn something from this. I, I enjoy doing this kind of thing. And, and again, I'm here for you. So, you know, let me know if I can do anything to, to be helpful to the sheep industry. All right. Well, thanks again, Todd. And since we'll be kind of hanging out and shelter in place till the end of May, we'll be probably coming forward with some other ideas over the next uh, month and a half. So stay tuned to the Youth Livestock um, Facebook and all that social media aspects. And um, we'll, we'll certainly do our best to keep you engaged educationally. So have a great weekend and we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week is swine with Katie and uh, we'll be over at the swine unit. No showering in will need to happen. Only, only Katie will have to do that next week. Um, but she's going to have a really neat uh, opportunity for us to, um, so plan next Friday, the 24th, right at one o'clock, we'll be at the swine unit and then we'll, we'll hit the beef folks um, the week after that. So thanks, Todd, Lynette, Taylor family, the Justin and Hayden. Uh, hopefully Hayden gets a haircut soon in that pink hat of his. Um, we, we enjoy you all. We can't do it without you. So have a well, great weekend, you, everybody. For organizing. Thank you, Bernie, for organizing these and putting these together. I think this is a, a big need build right now. So yes. appreciate everything you do as well. All right. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks. Take care, everyone.